Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, to you all uh, in this new course uh, on solar photovoltaics, in which we'll be talking about principles of solar photovoltaics, technologies that are uh, currently in use, as well as those uh, which have been researched over past few decades, and the materials which are used in these technologies, uh, in terms of type of materials, the issues, and various other material uh, aspects. So, this is the first lecture in which we are going to start uh, talking about this course. So, um, this course, so my name is let me just provide you my details. So, so my name is Ashish Kirk. I am a professor at uh, uh, material science and engineering department and uh, at IIT Kanpur. Okay. Uh, my email ID is uh, iitk.ac.in. Uh, you will be able to access the course details online as well. Uh, there will be two TAs of mine, uh, Mr. Sudhir Ranjan and Mr. Ajay Singh, who will help you with the questions that you may have. And if you have any, if they cannot solve your problems, then I will try and solve your problems. Uh, and you will have weekly assignments uh, on various topics, uh, after which you will have uh, exams. So, this course is basically, it, it, it is divided in, it is a 40 year, it is a 40 lecture course. So, each lecture is, is 30 minute lecture, approximately 30 minutes lecture. And uh, so, basically you will have, uh, you will have 8 weeks and over these 8 weeks we will cover various aspects of solar photovoltaics. So, in the first week, uh, we will discuss about basically introduction to solar cells, introduction to the area and then we will talk about solar radiation. You see, uh, the moment we talk of solar technologies, we first need to learn about what is solar radiation, what is it com consists of. Uh, how do you uh, define various matrices to quantify solar radiation and then how do you measure it. So, we will we will look at basically fundamental aspects of solar radiation then we will look at uh, um, geometrical relationships with with earth and then uh, quantifiable parameters and uh, methods to measure. So, this we will cover in the first week uh, hopefully and then in the week 2, we plan to undertake uh, essentially see most of the solar cell technologies especially solar photovoltaics they are built around semiconductors. So, it is essential to know the basics of semiconductors. So, we learn about fundamentals of semiconductors So, essentially uh, we will look at a semiconductor band diagram, types of semiconductors. electrical characteristics of semiconductor materials and so on and so forth. And then uh, once we have an understanding of semiconductors, then we will talk about uh, uh, basically three aspects. Uh, since you have semiconductors with carriers in electrons and holes, we will talk about carrier transport. We will talk about generation, 
generation means what happens when you shine light on a semiconductor, what, uh, how do charge carriers get generated and then we will talk about recombination. Because the moment you generate charge carriers, there is also tendency for of them to recombine. So, these three aspects are crucial to understand various physical processes in, semiconductor, in, in solar cell devices. And then in week 4, we will undertake uh, various junctions. Because a typical semiconductor solar cell device is a p-n junction uh, we'll to, uh, and, and these semiconductors are also attached to metals on both sides to make electrical contacts. So, as a result we will talk about uh, metal semiconductor junction and then p-n junction. And then in week 4 week 5 sorry, uh, we will do, we will understand the essential characteristics of photovoltaic devices. Essential characteristics of photovoltaics uh, in terms of electrical parameters, what kind of circuits can we depict solar cell in the form of what kind of resistances are there, what kind of quantifiable parameters are there to define the solar photovoltaics. Okay. And then week 7, we will week 6 sorry, week 6 we will define with, we will start with the solar photovoltaic technologies. And in this first week, we will discuss first generation solar technologies. The solar cell technology, solar photovoltaic technologies are divided in three categories broadly. First one is solar first generation technology, which is primarily based on single crystal silicon, polysilicon as well as gallium arsenide. So, first generation technologies, so basically single crystal silicon, gallium arsenide polysilicon okay. and we will we'll talk about technologies in general, we will talk about what the current numbers are, what current issues are, what kind of materials are used, how materials are fabricated, those issues we will talk about in the in this week. Then similar issues we will talk about in the week 7 about second generation technologies. And in second generation technologies are basically around thin film technologies. So, these are essentially bulk technologies, okay. bulk means where a thick wafer is used to make a silicon uh, a solar cell. In the second generation technologies, the amount of material was reduced by depositing the material in a thin film form. So, essentially these are thin film technologies as we call them and these are primarily based on cadmium telluride. CIGS or copper indium gallium selenide and amorphous silicon. So, these were the three major technologies which evolved as second generation uh, solar cell technologies and then the then in week 8 in the final leg of the course we will talk about third generation technologies where we will mainly talk about organic solar cells which are flexible lightweight based on polymers. Then we will talk about dye sensitized solar cells. These are also thin film technologies, but they are solution based technologies printable can be made using uh, mass production techniques, uh, uh, using liquid materials, liquid precursors and so on and so forth. So, they have lot of advantages in terms of uh, perovskite solar cells. So, these organic disensitized and perovskite solar cells are the ones which are basically primarily solution based technologies and they hold promise for future solar cells which can be made cheaply using techniques such as printing or solution processing. Now, uh, so, these, the work on these started somewhere around uh, late 90s, perovskite work started around uh, 2000, well late, uh, I would say about 2010 or so uh, and uh, these are right now uh, technologies of uh, tremendous interest because they hold lot of promise for 
future low cost solar cell technologies. And then in, in, in so in week 6, 7, 8 we will primarily discuss about the technologies, the materials which are used, the material issues that we have and the outlook where are these technologies going forward to. So this will be the focus for last 3 weeks where we will mainly talk about the technologies. So this is essentially the outline of the course. Uh, let me now tell you about certain reading material. In reading material, your uh, first book that you would like to be reading about solar fundamentals is Solar Energy uh, by S. P. Sukhatme and J. K. Nayak. This is a book which is which is although it is on solar thermal uh, primarily, it has first couple of chapters dedicated to fundamentals of solar radiation. So, if you want to learn about solar radiation, go to this book. Then second book is about the solar photovoltaics and semiconductors. So, I would say you can go through handbook of Handbook of Photovoltaic Science and Engineering, which is a very good book edited by A. Luke and S. Hegedus, and this is a book of Wiley Publishers. This is a fantastic book to learn about fundamentals of photovoltaic science and technologies and also on uh, basics related to semiconductors and in general photovoltaics. And another book that I will recommend is Physics of Solar Cells by Jenny Nelson. Uh, this is basically Imperial College Press. Again a very good book from the perspective of fundamentals as well as technology. So, these two books are primarily course based. Uh, the, these are the primarily, the, these are two books which you have to consider towards this course and this first book is for the uh, week 1 uh, part of the course. In addition to these three books, you can read uh, numerous, there are a lot of reviews. And journal articles which can be referred to especially for new technologies. You see these two books cover technologies which are first generation and second generation. Third generation technologies however are not covered very well in the in the textbooks. So, as a result uh, to know about the third generation technologies you have to go to uh, resources such as uh, these review papers and journal articles uh, especially for perovskite solar cells there are a lot of good reviews nowadays for organic solar cells and for disensitized solar cells. So, this is basically for uh, primarily for for uh, for new technologies okay and these two will cover aspects fundamental aspects of solar cells semiconductors as well as uh, first two generation technologies so what is the uh, so let me first begin with what is the motivation for this course so if i if i go back to uh, if i go to the slides for this course so the motivation for solar energy or solar photovoltaics is, uh, is from various factors. First factor is that energy demand worldwide is very rapidly increasing with the increase in population, with the increase in change in the lifestyle. For example, lifestyle of people in India has changed dramatically over past 20, 20, 20 30 years. And with the, with the advent of a lot of gadgets, with the advent of life around electricity, we require and, and for, the, for the progress of country in terms of science and technologies, one requires uh, to produce electricity non-stop. So, as a result, the energy requirement of this country, uh, not only our country, but also worldwide has increased tremendously. And this has put a lot of pressure on the resources that are available to us as, uh, as, as humankind. So, uh, the, the, the traditional source resources for making electricity is in the form of oil, gas or coal. However, we all know that the resources of oil, gas and coal are limited, they are not abundant, they are not everlasting and we need to develop technologies which can create electricity for us without 
changing the ecology without 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 deteriorating the environment moreover the uh, as when i when i talk to talk about the environment oil gas coal or any other source which is based on fossil fuels is essentially a conversion of raw material which is present in the atmosphere in the in the earth to uh, electricity it, it, uh, and this, this process is quite energy intensive and this also leads to creation of pollutants pollutants like carbon monoxide carbon dioxide sulfur oxide methane nitrous uh, nitrogen based gases and so on and so forth and lot of dust so pm 2.5 pm 110 kind of particulate matter is generated all these byproducts of en energy generation using fossil fuels are heavily polluting and this can be seen nowadays especially in our country where in winter in northern india you have substantial amount of haze in the atmosphere which is not good for us as a result we need to consider uh, technologies which can tackle this problem of looming problem of environmental pollution and uh, this is in fact one of the main drivers behind development of uh, new technologies which are uh, environment friendly and uh, this is where solar energy is very important because solar energy as we all know is uh, uh, is abundant you know uh, of course everything has a life even sun has a life but that lifetime is far beyond our expectations or our imagination so in in a practical way the solar energy which comes from sun is abundant so and this is where uh, scientists have been working for uh, past few decades to develop technologies which can harness this solar energy to convert into useful energy either in the form of heat or in the form of uh, electricity uh, to to fulfill our energy requirements and of course if we are able to do that it also brings a lot of social benefits to the community because you know uh, solar technologies can not only be grid connected they can also be stand alone so somebody who is living on a mountain somewhere doesn't need to connect his house his or her house to grid he he or she can directly produce electricity from from the sun by installing a little solar panel on top of his or her house so there are a lot of immense social benefits to especially to communities which are not in mainstream which are sort of disconnected but in general to overall community also there is a lot of social benefit in terms of uh, energy availability so what are the renewable energy technologies in this case which basically don't use so the idea is that we need to develop technologies which which are not fossil fuel based so that the pollution uh, or the environmental problem during the energy generation stage can be minimized but also we minimize the use of fossil fuel itself because generate because you know mining of coal and mine and ex exploitation of natural gas itself uh, has many uh, ramifications in the, in the in the form of environmental damage so what are the technologies that we we rely upon uh, the these technologies are called a renewable energy technologies which means the source of them is renewable it just keeps renewing itself so first is solar energy solar energy has two major components solar energy can be converted into heat and uh, solar, solar energy has heat and it has light the heat part of solar energy could be useful for generating heat in the form of hot water in the form of water filtration and so on and so forth and uh, the other part of solar energy is light which can be used to basically uh, generate uh, electricity so these two components of solar energy heat and light can together be used to generate electricity uh, uh, as we will see in, in in this course and then the other forms as well wind energy tidal energy wind energy is wherever you have a decent wind velocity especially around the coastal areas of the country or various other countries in europe which have high wind velocity they can generate uh, which they can convert this wind energy into useful electrical energy using wind turbines one can one can also think of converting tidal energy or uh, offshore or shore energy into uh, the energy which is available into tides of the sea uh, to convert into electricity then there is hydroelectricity there is biomass energy and there are a lot of other uh, methods of gen energy conversion which people are thinking among all of these solar energy stands out because simply because sol sun is a you know abundant source and it's available everywhere especially for a country like india which has very high solar uh, irradiance uh, it's really wonderful and in the light of this in 2008 prime minister of india launched a very ambitious program uh, called as jawaharlal nehru solar uh, national solar mission and in that so i will not read the whole paragraph but the idea was to to generate enough solar power for the country so that people of this country benefit and we have, we have energy availability in comparison to lot of other developed countries and also to 
steer various technology development and uh, industrial development in the country. So, the targets of this mission were to, to create a policy framework so that we are able to deploy 20 1000 megawatt 20 gigawatt of power by 2022 we are in 20, 2018 and right now approximate deployed capacity in this country is 25 gigawatt so we have already exceeded that target which is very good and uh, so th there were a lot of hefty targets a lot of them have been met but since the pace of development is extremely fast the the targets are going to be steeper in future than now so what are the uses of solar energy uh, well solar energy uh, can lead to generation of electricity through two means. First is the use of heat engines, which is basically by running the turbines, conversion of heat into electricity, and then use of photovoltaics, which can be done uh, by converting light into electricity. And uh, solar energy can also be used to do co conduct space heating or cooling through solar architecture. It can also be uh, used for disinfection of water via distillation or disinfection processes using UV and then uh, one can also use solar light for day lighting. You do not need to use these kind of lights uh, to, to light the houses if you intelligently design the windows. Solar can also be used for using hot water such as uh, for example, in IIT Kanpur we have uh, solar thermal uh, flat panels everywhere in every hostel uh, which provide enough hot water for various purposes and it is also used for cooking. So, there are multiple uses of solar energy which can be uh, useful uh, to us. So, if you look at the solar irradiance curve, uh, so uh, this is a plot which plots irradiance in watt per meter square per nanometer. So, essentially energy per unit area for that particular wavelength per nanometer. So, it is a spectral irradiance you can say and when it is plotted as a function of uh, wavelength. You can see that it shows a maxima at somewhere around 500 nanometer which is in the visible range. So, this particular spectra has three major reasons. First is the UV which is on the left for wavelengths smaller than about 400 nanometer, 350, 400 nanometer. Then uh, somewhere in the middle uh, up to about 700 nanometer we have visible range which is what we see and then at much longer wavelengths or lower energy we have infrared region. And it turns out that the uh, peak of solar irradiance is uh, it, it falls somewhere in the visible region which is good which is the useful part. So, you can see that solar, although solar, solar irradiance curve is very broad the most of the energy is centered around the visible region and this is what we have to harness. So, it has various components you can see that uh, you have the black line depicts the radiation which is emitted by a black body at about 6000 Kelvin to be precise it is about 5778 Kelvin. This black curve has so the energy under this black curve has various contributions. The yellow part is the one which is the sunlight which, uh, which is without any atmospheric absorbation, absorption the energy which is not absorbed by the atmosphere. And then we have these red bands which are uh, the, the energy in the red is the one which is sunlight that is available to us at the sea level. Okay. So, you can see that there is some deterioration from yellow to red, but it is still the energy available uh, if you look at the irradiance it is about 1.3 uh, watt per meter square per nanometer about 500 nanometer wavelength. And somewhere at higher wavelength in these uh, bands we have absorption bands. So, I have depicted some of them for example, you have oxygen absorption, you have a water absorption H 2 O all the H 2 O's depict absorption by the moisture and then somewhere at very high wavelength you have absorption by the C O 2. So, you can see here that if you have C O 2 present in the atmosphere you are going to trap this part of radiation. This is what is basically related to global warming. So, uh, that is why we say that you have if you have large amount of C O 2 and methane in the atmosphere they trap the heat and this is what happens. So, these are the CO2 sort of absorption bands uh, at about 2000 nanometer or so, but nevertheless this is what is the uh, solar irradiance curve that is available that is it is it's basically a simulated plot at uh, for a black body at 5778 Kelvin and this shows that the energy uh, most of the energy is centered in the visible and IR region and this is what is available for us to be harnessed. So, as per the calculations the mean extraterrestrial irradiance which is normal to solar beam 
available on the outer fringes of Earth at Earth's atmosphere is about 1.35 kilowatt per meter square. So, on every meter square area on the outer fringes of Earth's atmosphere, you get energy of about 1.35 kilowatt, uh, which is significant amount of energy. So, in this whole plot, if you now look at these uh, segments, the first segment uh, from UV to uh, you can say about 900 nanometer, 800 nanometer is useful for conversion through solar cells or solar photovoltaics, whereas thermal uses of solar energy uh, range directly somewhere around 300 nanometer to 50 nanometers right up to IR region. So, IR region is far more broad thermal uses. Uh, so, IR region is far more broad and this is what is very useful for thermal uses, whereas the, the part which is high energy part centered around the visible region is what is useful for the solar photovoltaics. Uh, so, let me give you some more numbers. So, these are the yearly solar fluxes and human energy consumption. So, essentially if you look at it, solar flux that is available to us is about if you look at the figures, it is here 3850 000 extra joules and 1 extra joules is about 10 power 8 is, is equal to 10 power 18 joules. So, you can see the amount of solar flux that is available to us is huge when you compare with the other energies. So, wind energy is for example, 2250 extra joules, biomass is 3000 extra joules. Uh, the primary energy use as per the data available of 2005 is about 500 or maybe right now it is about 1000 exajoules or so, whereas out of this electricity is about 60 uh, exajoules. So, you can see that there is a huge potential in the form of solar energy that is available to us. The amount of energy that is available is about 3.8 million exajoules, whereas what we consume is about 100, uh, maybe the figure right now is about 100 exajoules. So, so essentially, uh, the amount of solar energy that reaches the surface of planet is huge. It is about if you if you look at so this is the solar flux, but the amount of energy that reaches the uh, planet is about 1.7 into 10 to the power 17 watts in terms of watts. So somebody made this calculation and he turned he said that so this is a paper uh, in energy uh, in 2006. It was speculated that in one year the energy that falls on the surface of planet is about twice as much as we will ever obtain from other non-renewable uh, sources of energy such as coal, oil, natural gas as well as nuclear energy. So, this speaks a lot about solar energy, uh, the amount of solar energy that is available to us is simply huge. So, you can see that here you have 174 petawatts of energy that is coming to the surface out of 174 uh, petawatts, uh, 10 is reflected by the atmosphere, 35 petawatts is reflected by the clouds and then earth surface reflects about 7 petawatts and the remaining uh, is absorbed by land and uh, oceans and of course, 33 is absorbed by the atmosphere. And out of this 89 which is absorbed by the atmosphere, you have 12 that goes away um, uh, via conduction as well as uh, by rising that, that air, the air that rises and then uh, 40 uh, goes as uh, latent heat in water vapor and then uh, out of this then we have the third portion which is about 36 out of 36 26 is uh, 26 goes uh, as radiation which is absorbed by the atmosphere and 10 uh, goes as radiation from the uh, earth to space. So, if you count these 33, 12, 40 and 26 this is basically 111 uh, petawatt which is radiation radiated to the space from the atmosphere. So, uh, basically this is the uh, mathematics of the whole energy that comes in and goes out. So, this is a solar irradiance plot and this solar irradiance plot tells you for the whole globe the energy that is incident and you can see that this is where we are, this is India somewhere here and this uh, so, the most intense band is the yellow band which is about 400 watts per meter square and if you go to orange, red and so on and so forth, the energy reduces. You can see that the yellow band and the orange band passes through a large part of Africa, Mediterranean and uh, India. So, solar irradiance, so India is very lucky to be on the, on the, on the part of the planet where solar irradiance is extremely high. And this is what India makes an exciting destination for the deployment of 
solar technologies. So, there are technologies. So, basically we can say that large solar energy incident on India, uh, uh, especially western part of the country. And uh, this is where uh, solar energy can be useful. So, solar energy is essentially useful in two contexts. The first context is uh, you can say the solar thermal and the second is solar photovoltaics and it is this solar photovoltaics that we will uh, study in this course. So, let me show you some pictures of these technologies. Um, so, this is for instance a picture of uh, this is a picture of uh, open rooftop thermal collector, where you have these thermal collectors, which are connected to these storage tanks. These uh, the, the panels are inclined to, to uh, at certain angle, so as to maximize the collection of energy. And uh, they have some black body, some black material, which absorbs energy. And this energy is converted to heat, which is taken away by the fluid, working fluid, which is typically water in these flat panel collectors. And there are tubes underneath somewhere in this panel and which and the hot water. So, that you have a cold water inlet and then you have a hot water outlet. The hot water is stored in these tanks, uh, which is taken away for the uh, for the use. So, this is what is the design of a typical open rooftop thermal collector. And uh, solar energy can also be used uh, in the form of uh, solar concentrators. So, essentially what you do is that. Uh, so, in this in the previous case, the energy of the, 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 the area of the collector is equal to area of the receiver, okay, because it is a flat panel. So, whatever the surface is available is directly receiving the sunlight. What happens in concentrator is uh, you use a curved surface which is a reflecting surface. So, area of receiver is far higher as compared to. So, area of you can say the reflecting surface you can say do not worry about the receiver and collector terms as yet. But area of the surface which receives the sunlight, which is the curved surface, is very large. And all of this energy which falls on this uh, curved surface is reflected back onto the central portion. So, you can see here. So, this is the central tube. So, this is the central tube uh, along which you have a working fluid, let us say water or some sort of oil or something else. And this gets heated through the reflection of large surface uh, through the reflection of sunlight from a large surface area. So, essentially this is, so this surface is a concentrating surface which concentrates energy which is incident on it to a smaller area which carries, uh, which, which is basically a tube which carries the working fluid like water or oil. So, this is a parabolic trough collector which is called a solar concentrator. Another design could be uh, you can have variety of these panels at various angles and all of them are reflecting light to a particular point here. So, this is a solar power tower. So, you have a small smaller area surface which is collecting power from these reflecting surfaces. Okay. So, this is basically again solar concentration kind of technology. So, this is solar thermal typically and then we can have solar photovoltaics uh, which directly convert electricity uh, solar energy into electricity. The efficiencies vary at the cell level depending upon the type of technology between 8 and 40 percent. In fact, up to 40 percent that would be correct number. And there are various variants, single crystal technologies such as silicon and gallium arsenide, thin films, amorphous silicon, thin film silicon, cadmium telluride, CIGS, organic, disensitized. Then we have multi-junction solar cells, quantum dots, plasmonic solar cells, variety of technologies are there. These are all right now uh, for many of these technologies cost is a problem, but silicon is, but solar, solar photovoltaic technology is getting very cost competitive right now. These are certain efficiencies which are on commercial scale. So, we can see that we have numbers as low as about 11.5 or 10 percent 
right up to about 46 percent. So, depending upon the type of technology, you have a variety of efficiencies available. Not all of them are commercial though, and many of them are right now under the lab scale. So, this is what a solar photovoltaic panel would look like. You have this uh, uh, a desert sort of landscape in which you have this scores of solar panels, which are all receiving energy uh, on a barren land, which was otherwise unuseful, and these are all converting direct light into electricity. So, this is what is the potential of solar photovoltaics. So, what we will do is that in the next class, we will discuss about, uh, so this is, this is just an introductory lecture. In the next class, what we will talk about is uh, solar radiation, what, is, what do we mean by solar radiation, what is the spectrum like, what are the various uh, mathematical terms that are used to define it and then we will look at some of the geometrical relationship which sun makes with earth. Uh, to, so, that which are useful in estimating the amount of radiation that you get on a surface uh, at a given location uh, at a given time. And then we will look at uh, what are the ways in which solar radiation is quantified and how do we measure it that we will do over pass over next uh, 3 4 lectures. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, so, uh, with from the next class we will be a little bit more focused in terms of content of this course. Uh, so, we will we'll perhaps uh, see each other in next class. Thank you.